Hi hey everybody, we're here at the fourth Roadmap Conference. My name is Drell and I'm here with Terry. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Happy to be here and excited to be around all of these e-mobility professionals. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, what brought you here and what company you're representing? Yeah, so I've been coming to the conference uh, probably the last five years. Uh, and really it's an opportunity for folks from around the country and around the ecosystem to convene and talk about e-mobility best practices. So, yeah, it's one of the things that if you work in industry, you should definitely be here. Cool. And what company are you here uh, representing? So it's EV Noir. I actually wear a number of hats, but I'll start by saying um, myself and Dr. Francis co-founded a company, EV Noir. We work on electric, connected, shared, and autonomous vehicle technologies. We also work on e-mobility, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I have a couple questions for you. Uh, the first question I have for you is, what are some barriers BIPOC people are facing in the EV industry? Lack of representation. So one of the things is, is that We've been working in this space. We were one of the first companies that was BIPOC owned working in this mobility space. And more times than not, when I present, speak at conferences, working with partners, it's my team and my team. And so the idea is that we're starting to see, as the ecosystem continues to grow, we're starting to see more diversification, but we need you know, more diverse communities so we have more diverse perspectives. We need to make sure that there's gender parity, all of the things that are gonna be representative of the growth of e-mobility. Who are you and uh, what brought you here today? Great, thanks. Uh, great to share a story. Um, I'm Eugene Palmer from South Africa. Uh, been involved in the automotive industry for the last 10 years, uh, the last 20, uh, 20 years, sorry, and in the last 10 years within sustainable transport. Uh, with that, uh, it's also taking the ecosystem approach for electric mobility, because it's not just about the mode of mobility. It is really looking at the ecosystem from the energy to the charging infrastructure, to the types of mobility that we're going to use, to skills development, and also making sure that we manage these products at the end of life and that's what's critical is understanding the ecosystem around it. yeah i'm here with jr how are you doing today doing great how are you doing great so can you tell us a little bit about how you're involved with fourth and uh kind of what you do sure um uh, do you want me to hold this uh i'm a program manager for the access to cars team and i run i handle the outreach for evs charging around the state but also in southern Cali southern washington and northern california so I do events uh, to basically educate people about electric vehicles, charging, charging infrastructure, and like the different ways to charge. Um, I think that's the biggest shift from driving a gas vehicle. So just kind of educating them on that. Um, otherwise, I think the vehicles are amazing, good technology, and the charging infrastructure still needs to be built, but kind of helping prepare people for that change, uh, I think makes a big difference. But the main difference is getting, I, I call it getting their butts in the seats. Once they drive an EV and they feel that instant torque and they learn about how inexpensive they are, it kind of blows their mind. Like it's like, oh really, I can like, you know, I don't have to pay that much for maintenance anymore. Like basically you're just putting tires on your car. <laughs> I think that's about all you have to do and make sure you charge it regularly. Yeah. I'm here with Rebecca. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing just fine. And can you tell us um, how you uh, became a part of this and uh, a little bit about you were one of the speakers? So Yeah, yeah, thank you. So here at the Roadmap Conference, I'm, uh, I'm from the Climate Works Foundation and the Drive Electric Campaign. And so we're a supporter of a lot of the work that's being uh, showcased here at the Roadmap Conference. We're a philanthropy, so we, you know, basically go out and support leadership that's already happening in communities all over the world to help accelerate EV adoption. So that that's my role here is just to raise up the voices of the folks that we are already supporting to, so that everyone can hear their stories of how they're succeeding. Yeah. Can you discuss the potential job creations due to the growth of the EV industry? Yeah, so I mean, we're seeing exponential growth. When I first started coming here, we were not at the convention center. So the idea is that now that the conference has moved to the convention center, you're seeing exponential growth. To that point, it's important that as we see the, the country becoming a much more diverse space, that the folks who are participating in this ecosystem are reflective of that. To that point, we actually, two things I'll say. 
One, myself and a few others in our org, co-founded the nation's largest network of diverse EV drivers and enthusiasts. So in addition to being an e-mobility professional, I actually have an organization that is mostly black and Latinx EV drivers from around the country as well as internationally. Second part of that is, is that to address the issues around diversification of the workforce, we actually launched the e-mobility fellowship program, which it's targeted at underrepresented communities, so we are going to HBCUs, HSIs, native and tribal institutions, uh, community and technical colleges, to train them to actually be the next generation of professionals working in this space. So we see that as a real problem and a gap, and it has to be you know, addressed. And that's our theory of change, was to create this e-mobility fellowship program. Yeah, so um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is, you know, you overseeing a lot of the industry in South Africa. What are some things that you all are doing there that you think we can implement here in America to make our process of getting electric vehicles and developing them here in the United States? Yeah, so I think the, the key reflection is, is looking at it from an ecosystem perspective as well. Uh, within the challenges of energy access, how do we then strengthen the grid capacity within microgrids environment to support the energy demand uh, for charging of electric vehicles? Then on multimodal systems, how do we look at the different types of mobility to meet the requirements of uh, mobility as well? Uh, it's not only about passenger cars, there's multimodal transport systems that we can start using uh, to apply that uh, in those applications. And then also from recycling, uh, there's a big challenge on critical minerals and how do we use, use the, the resources from, you know, at end of life to then support manufacturing. Um, there's one of the key reflections is that the U.S. there's no uh, firm regulation on end of life management on, on, on e-waste, whereas South Africa that was reduced uh, in recent months. Okay. So these are the types of, of uh, frameworks that we can see that are being implemented that the U.S. region can, can also reflect on. And then also strengthening global trade. Um, there's certain benefits that uh, you know, each region has, whether it's minerals, whether it's innovation and development, and through cross-collaboration and partnerships between between the, the countries and the region, we can then uh, strengthen those specific activities. Yeah. For people who are lower income, uh, may come from underrepresented communities, how do they get some sort of access, loan, rebate, or something to be able to afford an electric vehicle? Great question. Um, so there's two things. Um, initially, uh, I would say the best thing they should do is sign up for like a car share program. So fourth has a, pro and I can't speak too intelligently on this because I'm not a part of this program, but I know enough about it. Uh, there's a, fourth has a car share program called Go Forth, and we have about, I think, 11 cars currently in Oregon and also some in St. Louis, but St. Louis is not publicly operated, um, around Oregon where you can rent a, an EV for two to four dollars an hour mm -hmm. and utilize that car for as long as you need. You can go shopping, you can go to the beach, you can go whatever you need, go to the doctor, whatever you know, whatever you need to do. And then at the end of the day, you bring it back, you plug it in, you pay your whatever, however much time you spend on it. Um, it it's a bit of a process to kind of get the app, get acclimated and getting everything set up on the app, yeah. but it's a great program. Um, it's the cheapest in the country. And it's pretty amazing. And you may have seen the bolt out there. There's mm -hmm. two cars back there. Those are part oh, of yeah. our Go Forth car share. Okay. Yeah. So they're they're amazing, um, and we specifically target uh, underserved communities to make sure that they have them. So like housing housing communities, we'll put those cars. What are some barriers BIPOC people are facing in the EV industry? Yeah. Great question. Um, I think a lot of it, I think, is just access to knowledge. Having these types of events that are specifically for those people or events in areas where they like farmers markets where they may they may uh, shop and, and like uh, spend time in um, I think will help them a lot um, I try to get in front of as many crowds as possible but you know I think that's the biggest thing for people shifting people to EVs mm -hmm. how can underrepresented communities benefit economically from the rise of the EV industry yeah, this is a great question. So one of the things that's not really well understood by a lot of us is that EVs can be the lowest cost transportation option. Once the battery prices get a little lower and they you know, estimate that this will be in another two or three years, EVs, because there's no maintenance on them and you can essentially plug them into an outlet and you, you get, you know, the, the, you're essentially just paying for those electrons, they can be incredibly low cost 
options for households that need to get around and the you know the electricity rate is is stable for the most part whereas gas prices right they go up and down and up and down and it messes with at least for me my like like weekly budgeting process as as a household and i think particularly for communities particularly frontline communities in places like Los Angeles that's where i live right we're right near the port of Los Angeles and there's such dirty trucks that are polluting all of the neighborhoods around the the 710 freeway and the port and then also the distribution center. As we start to electrify those trucks and the cars that also drive on those highways, those communities will see a dramatic increase in the air quality in their region. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just it's it's not only that you can benefit from the jobs created as we were just discussing, but also uh, the the disproportionate impacts of air pollution will start to become alleviated. I think one of the key messages highlighted yesterday's day was that equity. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the transition that's happening right now in terms of making sure that no community is left behind. Uh, we have the same scenario in South Africa uh, in terms of that and, and how do we introduce these uh, technologies into the right communities that don't have the excess income to afford these vehicles but yet we can then customize the typical solutions for those communities to making sure that the transport is affordable and sustainable and that's how we can bridge the gap so that nobody is left behind in this in this transition. Can you discuss the potential job creations due to the growth of the EV industry? Yeah, happy to. This is huge, right? So one of the major problems with the internal combustion engine is that so much of that whole system, the vehicle itself, but also the fuel, is from outside the U.S. All of the jobs are, are a lot of the jobs are outside the U.S. Other countries are, are enriching themselves with our money, whereas with EVs, we're filling those tanks with electrons that we've created here locally by solar panels that are installed by people locally, by wind turbines that are installed and maintained by local job jobs essentially and another really awesome component of EVs is that we've set up the uh, infrastructure uh, the IRA the um, infrastructure act that was recently passed by Congress to really ensure that a lot of the EV jobs and EV manufacturing are brought back into the US so that we can benefit not only from cleaner air and solving climate change but also from creating better greener jobs mm -hmm. that give people the a type of salary that they can actually live on. Where do you think the EV industry will be in the next five years? I'm glad you asked. So one of the things that I'll say is we along with Forth uh, a few years ago um, collaborated and through a number of conversations where we saw there was a huge opportunity, we decided to launch an e-mobility diversity, equity, inclusion conference um, where we take a deep dive into just that question. Where I see the industry going in the future is, is that there'll be more vehicles across modes um, that will basically apply for, they'll be applicable to any sector or industry that you want. So micromobility, light duty passenger, school bus electrification, transit, medium heavy duty, as well as sustainable aviation and maritime and all of those things. But I think as we begin to create economies of scale and innovation, that you'll see um, a very different future. If we're having this conversation five years from now, I think it'll look very different because more people will have adopted clean transportation. Yeah, the, the, there's a big reference that um, the automotive industry is facing its biggest disruption in the last century. Uh, and that we're seeing with electrification of transport targeting uh, emissions within cities. Uh, so with that is, a, is, is really a global clampdown uh, in terms of the technologies and, and there's mass acceleration towards that. I think what it comes down to each region's political will. Mm -hmm. and what are they shaping for their specific region uh, within their specific country and not forgetting the city. Cities are really taking a lot of little bold leadership in terms of that. So as and where we see the progression in terms of those developments in every region, it will really catapult and, and then drive deployment of electric vehicles. But certainly we're seeing the opportunities of sustainable energy together with electric mobility really becoming a key framework for a lot of regions and we look forward to that. Mm -hmm. the the last question I have for you is, where do you see the EV industry being in the next five years? Yeah, my hope is that the EV industry is essentially 
dominating the car market mm -hmm. and the truck market too. Right? We just talked about how trucks are a huge source of pollution and that a lot of that industry is, is here in the US, obviously benefiting from the free trade agreements that we have with other countries, but really here in the US and that there's more diversification as well. So we don't have just a couple companies selling EVs, but we have smaller companies and medium sized companies benefiting from the whole EV industry, right? Because I've been talking a lot about the vehicle itself, mm -hmm. but there's of course the charging infrastructure and um, and all of the, the things related to batteries, second life of the batteries, recycling the batteries, using them in like, you know, portable battery kind of uh, use cases where you can kind of pull them around and plug in a food truck or something into the batteries. So there's just, a, there's a lot of the, um, of the kind of architecture of the industry that will become more mature in the next couple of years. It's super exciting for me. Grant programs that are set up to establish chargers every 50 miles along major corridors. So like in, in Oregon, on I-5, every 50 miles there will be uh, a, high, a DC fast charger or a GC fast charger station. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the substreets, like on the side streets that kind of co connect those corridors, um, basically utility companies are funding the development of that infrastructure. So every 50 miles from those, those major corridors are gonna be charging stations along those routes. Um, and going to areas where many people go, you know, in Oregon, a lot of it is going to the, to the parks to go skiing or go to the coast to go to the beach or whatever. So all those routes are gonna be handled within the next three to five years. Okay. And that will completely change the EV infrastructure because the biggest challenge right now is like, where do I charge my car? How, how do I get here and there, you know? And I have a lot of mountains in this state. I'm from New York, so a lot of mountains in the state that you have to go over these mountain passes. You're going over like up 2,000, 5,000 feet, whatever. So it's gonna be a bit of a, a, a project, but I think in three to five years, you're gonna have a, a much different experience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it should be great. Excellent. Well, there's a lot of good information here that we just got from JR. So thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Great to meet you. Good to meet you too. <laughs> thank you.